The Provoke Podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. Welcome, everybody, to another Provoke Media Podcast. Um, I am honored to be joined today uh, by Joseph Kingsbury, who is the U.S. Managing Director for Edelman Business Marketing, and by Victoria Morrissey, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Ferguson. And I am going to start this conversation, which is going to delve into uh, B2B marketing generally and uh, some of Edelman's recent research into thought leadership in B2B marketing uh, by asking Victoria to tell us a little bit about herself and a little bit about uh, Ferguson, which is a company that I suspect most of you interact with far more often than you think you do or know you do. Victoria. Yes, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Joe, for having me. Uh, I have been with Ferguson uh, almost 10 months um, as their chief marketing officer, grew up in the agency business, so had the opportunity to work on a wide range of different industries, customer types um, at some of the world's largest agencies. I then uh, took a pause and started a consulting business and then went client side. So spent some time at Granger, um, at the Kellogg School Caterpillar, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, and now a company, uh, Paul, to touch on that maybe uh, is what we like to call it one of the better kept secrets, right? One of the largest companies most people have probably never heard of. Ferguson is a $24 billion um, value added distributor. Um, but what's interesting is it isn't about moving boxes. Um, we specialize in helping solve complex problems and making complex projects simple and successful for our customers. Uh, we are right in the middle of a brand overhaul. Um, and so being very clear on our purpose, uh, what we are and our points of difference. And so we sit in a very unique place in that um, we specialize in key areas. And yet, I think, Paul, to your point, a good number of folks interact with our showrooms, our e-commerce platform, um, or other fixed or finished goods um, products that they probably don't even know come through Ferguson. But that's going to change in the coming months. We're going to make sure everybody knows about uh, who we are and what we do. Cool. Um, obviously, you have a pretty robust B2B background. Mm -hmm. um, how much of that was intentional? Was there something about the space which, let's be honest, many people in our profession regard as less sexy than, you know, cars sure. or airlines or even, you know, soap flakes and and uh, pasta products? What what's so what's so much fun about the B two B space? Yeah, actually, Paul, I'm going to be a little provocative here. Uh, it might be less sexy, but it's a whole lot more meaningful. Um, and so it was a very intentional decision. I I made having worked in the agency business and having the benefit of working across a wide variety of industries. Um, my journey in B2B on client side really started with Granger. And the realization there was uh, motion plays a much bigger role because risk is so much greater in B2B. And um, the people that, that live and work in that space actually do the work that makes the world a better place. And I, and I like to joke with people and no offense, you, know, you don't save the world with coffee and shoes. Um, when I think about what Granger did in keeping buildings running, Caterpillar uh, building, um, right? And Ferguson, the ability to, to, to enable the projects that leave the world a better place, it's deeply rooted in purpose um, and meaning. And it's hard and it's complicated, um, but quite frankly, uh, it matters a great deal. And our employees feel that pride across the board. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to to what you said about emotion a little okay. bit later because okay. I think that's um, another sort of slightly provocative idea about business to business marketing. I think we all assume that business decision makers are cold, rational, hard numbers folks who uh, just want the facts. So I'm interested in the role of of emotion yeah. and storytelling generally in the marketing process. But Joe, to bring bring you into the conversation a little bit. Um, tell me um, about the thought leadership impact study that that is sort of the the premise, I guess, of of this conversation, and um, what what you were looking for, and a little bit about what you found. 
Yeah, well, the origin of it really goes back to a problem that we were trying to figure out um, probably about four years back where we uh, increasingly had clients who were uh, you know, very um, sort of invested in publishing thought leadership, right, on behalf of a company, on behalf of an executive. Um, obviously, you know, uh, communications of that kind had been happening for a long time before that, but it was around four to five years ago where uh, a lot of our clients were beginning to ask, what is the business impact of what we're doing, right? And so it was an activity that largely was, and I guess to some degree still is, sort of owned by the communications function, or at least, you know, shepherded by the comms function. And um, it, it's one of those things where you just kind of intuitively know, yes, this is having an impact on our reputation. It gives us access to different kinds of stakeholders that we, you know, desire to engage with, things of that nature. But um, as we were working with CMOs, and Victoria might appreciate this, increasingly we were getting questions around, how can we figure out what the bottom line impact is? Is it driving demand for our business? Is it moving us into new sectors? Is it, you know, all kinds of questions kind of related to, um, you know, demand, impact on sales, et cetera. And so we were looking for research uh, that answered those questions and couldn't find any that was really satisfying our clients. And so we partnered up with LinkedIn um, to figure out what is the impact of thought leadership within B2B demand generation. So we've been studying this now on an annual basis for the past five years uh, with a pause to do uh, sort of some COVID related research um, on the topic last year. But, you know, I guess just at a, at a very high level, what we found over the past five years is that thought leadership absolutely has impact beyond just high funnel awareness it actually drives purchasing behavior all the way through and beyond the funnel or the customer journey, if you want to think of it that way. So it's directly contributing to uh, revenue wins and, and purchases, as well as generating loyalty um, and, and uh, is also a catalyst for things like upselling, cross-selling, um, you know, new capabilities and products as well. So that's really kind of the, you know, the crux of it. And, um, you know, and this year, uh, in the most recent study that we looked at, we focused in specifically on what the impacts of the pandemic and everything going toward digital publishing is having on how global B2B buyers, um, you know, view uh, thought leadership in their purchasing decisions. Right. There's something slightly meta, I think, about having a conversation um, around thought leadership that is based on a piece of Edelman's thought leadership that, um, that, that comes from an agency whose thought leadership, you know, particularly in the trust space, has been um, such a brand builder for you. I, I, I dare say you're totally convinced of the case. Victoria, does that, does that mesh with your experience? Have you always been in environments where thought leadership was seen as central to the marketing and communications brand building strategy of the companies you worked with? You know, actually, I would say no, unfortunately. I think um, the, the issue of going back to your earlier comment, Paul, about um, B2B being kind of hard and fast with numbers. We'll talk a little bit later about how our customers make decisions. But within a corporation, if you're in a conservative company, it is often, it has been my experience, that it is better to be quiet and to not stand up and have a voice in certain areas. Um, which is a challenge because when it's just about products, products are essentially ubiquitous. You know, Caterpillar makes great iron, but so, do the, so, so does the competition. So where does the voice, to me, it's all about the voice and it really becomes a part, not only where do you have permission to have a point of view, but where is there an expectation from your audience and your customer group to be a thought leader, right? To look forward. I think about what Ferguson does and I won't go into all the details, but we, we serve all kinds of industries. Well, infrastructure is a critical component to our success, not just about buying product, but about how do I spec a job? How do I, how do I build it out? Who do I need to help me with expertise on how I install or build or keep running? Um, so I, it has been a challenge for most companies um, because I think a conservative B2B company tends to not want to rock the boat or call attention. I'm happy to say in the space where I am today, which is part of the reason this is such an amazing opportunity, um, is we're being very deliberate about 
evaluating where we want our voice to be heard, right? What is that piece or two of true thought leadership? And I don't think we're quite there yet, but there's a lot of work to understand where we can have impact and quite honestly, where we have permission. So one area that is being explored is water. You know, when you think about what Ferguson started and was known for out of the gate is a plumbing company, right? And, and we still are, but we're just that much more. Well, there's a little bit of that heritage gives us not just the trust and credibility, but actually the expectation that all of the things around water, water conservation, um, drinking water, water efficiency, um, we have to have a voice there just as, a, as an example. So Unfortunately, I don't think it's a strength of a lot of um, conservative B2B companies, but it's a critical component to the brand launch as well as to our corporate communications work, especially in the area of ESG. Cool. Um, one of the things that you draw attention to, um, Joe, in the in the research is the this glut of um, thought leadership content that ends up online, um, partly as a result of the pandemic. And I'm, I'm interested in a couple of things. I'm interested from your perspective on whether that was in fact pandemic related and will therefore maybe um, recede slightly as we move forward or whether you think that's now a permanent part of B2B marketing. And then um, for, for both of you, really, um, Victoria in particular, I'm interested in sort of if there is this glut, how on earth do you make your content stand out and cut through? Yeah, I think that thought leadership, um, it's hard to imagine it going away. Uh, you know, it, it's become, I think it is increasingly becoming sort of one of the primary ways that B2B companies go to market. And as Victoria, you know, talked about differentiate themselves, um, elevate themselves in the minds of customers and, and prospects and other, you know, stakeholders. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, at least, you know, kind of in our universe is that, um, you know, B2B companies, you know, they understand that, you know, the brand is important and I don't sort of delve into that whole thing, but it's also really important to have a point of view on what's happening in the world and how that relates to customers. And so in terms of, um, you know, digital publishing as a, you know, as a, a medium for kind of expressing that and connecting with customers, I don't see that um, really receding um, anytime soon. The glut was, I, if we look at the data, it was beginning to happen sort of pre-pandemic. It was just very much accelerated by the pandemic because of obviously things like, uh, you know, industry events going online, um, you know, one-to-one -one sales interactions um, sort of going away. So, um, I, you know, if you look at, I mean, just to cite sort of a, a, another organization, McKinsey, who's looked at this topic as well. I think that uh, many of the behaviors from B2B buyers have been sort of meaningfully and, and maybe permanently shifted because the, uh, the majority of B2B buyers actually prefer um, sort of guiding their own buyer experience, largely with information that they're discovering about you online. Um, so it's, it's hard to see that going away anytime soon. Okay. And, and Victoria, what, um, you know, what, what are you seeing in terms of what, or, or what are you looking at in terms of cutting through the clutter that's out there now? I, I, it, it goes to really understanding customer. And I think, you know, the idea of back to what do you have permission to talk about? And more importantly, where is there an expectation? It, it's, it's, you know, understanding where your customer is going to have their problem solved. I think about Ferguson and we do the hard things really well. And so making complicated projects more simple and then successful is our purpose. Well, where are our customers going if they're not reaching out direct to our sales force? Where are they going to get the tools they need to go through that and, you know, and clarify some of that complexity? So it's knowing where they are and they're all over the place for us, right? That's part of the challenge we have going forward, making sure we actually speak their language. There's a lot of content out right now, thought leadership that in many ways is, is talking at customers or down to customers as opposed to with them. And I think that's a really critical nuance. So it's where are they? Are you speaking their language and, and being really clear What's the therefore what at the end of that engagement with thought leadership? Did you leave them better than you found them? And I, I just, that's the litmus test that we're putting everything up again. Did that five minutes they took to read that, did you solve a problem and did you, did you 
make them feel better, not to just sell them a product. That comes if you if you do the other piece, right? If you're really seen as that resource and that expert. So quite honestly, Paul, we're in the early stages of it. As I mentioned, we're just articulating brand, but that voice is was core to the brand platform. We used archetypes to get to that voice. And we're going to hold everybody accountable to making sure that the takeaway is is that of the, you know, the archetype we've identified and are we leaving our customers better? Was it what time well spent? Just to quickly underline that point by Victoria yep. earlier about really understanding the specific needs of customers in our research, what we found was that nearly half of global B2B buyers said that the thought leadership that is aimed at them, that they're consuming does not even seem to be created with their needs in mind. What's, what's the challenge for you as a marketer to, um, to bring in people from other parts of the company? I, I, I'm assuming that you know, the, the leadership and, and the expertise is yeah. in a host of other more operational departments um and you need to therefore get their buy-in that this yep. is important yep. um, and then help them speak the language of your customers not just the language of their own narrow expertise how much of a challenge is that and 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 taking a company that hasn't necessarily been deep into thought leadership in the past and persuading them that this is something that they now have to do in addition to their day job as it were mm-hmm. So it's a great question, Paul, and I'm going to share we're early in the journey, and I hope I'm not jinxing myself here. Um, the, the first thing the CEO asked me to take a look at is articulate the brand, right? Back to brand. We've never we've never identified ourselves, and, and there's a lot of reasons we did that. And so we did two things. We, we, we kind of knew where we were going, but we brought along all the business leaders, including corporate communications, supply chain, the distribution group, and did a workshop and said, what if, help us answer these critical questions, right? What are we? Why do we exist? And so you get, you start there, right? You get buy-in where people's voice is heard. Then as we built that out, we began an internal rollout. We haven't gone external with, with this brand work and that's on purpose. And so we started sharing it with our internal customers, right? Our internal, our associates, they are critical for a stakeholder. Um, and, and what was amazing was when you, when you can simply explain why this company exists and, and why we get up every single day and why we are better at serving those customers than anybody, people, it's a, it was a, an, a, a missing piece, right? I mean, there, these, these folks were hungry. And so it became about storytelling, Paul. And that's where we started is it's an internal conversation that was grounded in leadership alignment. And we put it out to our sales force, our drivers, our counter folks, our salespeople, the people touching the customer. And we said, this is who you are. This is your pride. This is what you do every day. Tell us your stories. Tell us examples of how we exist to simplify the complex, how we serve this community of proud builders. I mean, that resonated far and wide. And it's been an an influx of the stories because truthfully, from my perspective, any good brand marketing, thought leadership, fill in your blank, is about storytelling, all of it. And storytelling is a two-way dialogue. And so that's where we started, Paul. We said, let's articulate what, what we do and why we do it and see what response we get. And, and so now it's about, you know, parsing through the stories, you know, the what happens after you buy the product. It's not about dropping off the product. It's all the other things that go around it. And I think we're going to have the problem of too many stories, which is, of course, never, um, never a problem. And so it's listening, you know, two ears, one mouth is the other thing my mother said to me many, many years ago. We're so busy telling people what they should do that we have to stop and listen and then help them. And I think, Joe, that goes a little bit to what you said, which is if you don't understand what the need is, how are you going to give them anything that is going to help them solve that problem? So I I guess that's a long-winded answer, Paul, but it was the idea of getting alignment on the overall platform and then handing it to people and saying, can you live this? And having them say, thank God you just handed me this thing because holy Toledo, do I have stories for you? Right. And that's, that's the most powerful way um, to share. So so that, that emphasis on, on storytelling sort of brings us back to something you were saying earlier about, about the power of emotion, Mm -hmm. um, which, which, 
really interests me because, as I said, I think a lot of people, and I probably probably have to admit to, to being one of them most of the time, I think that B2B marketing is less about emotion and more about calm, rational choices. But also, um, you know, stories, storytelling is emotion. Stories are about provoking uh, uh, an emotional response first and foremost. So how do you how do you strike that balance and where does emotion become important? Emotion becomes important from the very beginning. And I would argue it's more important in B2B than in B2C across the board. And the, and when I say emotion, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be puppies and rainbows. It's, it, it becomes, uh, it is directly correlated to risk, right? So think about risk mitigation. And I, I've done a presentation and I joke about if you buy the wrong cereal or the wrong toilet paper, you're not going to get thrown out of the house maybe, right? But when you're making business decisions, when you have to keep your people safe, when you have to deliver a job on time, when you have to make sure you're on budget and your reputation is on the line, that's risk, that's high emotion. And so you, the decisions you're going to make are with those partners that you trust and that you know will go the extra mile with you, that care as much about your project as you do. That's emotion, right? That is deeply seated. I think we use the rational and the numbers, Paul, as you said, to justify our decisions, but it's not how we make our decisions. Every decision is made based on emotion and it's heightened in B2B because the stakes are just that much higher. And quite frankly, from a marketer, that's just more fun. Right. So, I mean, it sounds like trust and credibility and just the feeling that, you know, you're there and ready to step in and help and support is sort of the the most critical element of this is that fair and how do you how do you communicate that in thought leadership um well i mean that's a great question it depends on what type of thought leadership right because it takes on many forms the idea of mitigating risk the idea of having the expertise and the person you can rely on and count on and the person could be digital right it doesn't have to be an actual salesperson um uh, again, I, I guess I would just go back to, did I leave them better than I found them? Did we give them information that helped overcome a hurdle or a challenge? Did we simplify something? Did we help them make that more successful? And I, I you know, again, we've got a ways to go in actually building the thought leadership there, but that is at the heart and soul um, of, of what we've been doing in our people. So now we need to transfer that to our thought leadership. They are seen as a trusted partner, right? Not just a trusted, not just a trusted partner, but an unbiased expert is how they often view our customers and they or our, our employees. And they talk about that. But because as a distributor, we aren't beholden to a particular brand or product, right? We're about the end result with our customers. And so I would just say to you, the challenge I have is how do I help translate that expertise, that unbiased expert, which is how they talk about our associates, into the voice in marketing, but I have a great team who's been doing it, who, who will help guide us. It is leading with the customer needs and being the Sherpa, right? That's how we talk about our archetype. We have the knowledge, we have the wisdom, but we don't want the glory. That's what the customer gets. And so we step back and make sure they have the right products and services. And when there's issues, we help them right size it. So I'm, I, I'm not sure, Joe, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul, if I've totally answered your question, um, but it really, it, it, it goes to understanding um, how we're better suited to solve their complexity than anyone. And we do it truly by listening and by being consistent in solving and mitigating risk. And I just had a remark about Victoria's comments earlier when she talked about Caterpillar and um, and I'm sure many other companies could fit into this bucket, but, you know, they make good iron as do others. And, you know, I grew up in enterprise technology. We, we kind of talk about that as being speeds and feeds, right. And, and, and absolutely things like speeds and feeds matter, but it, it's, it just goes so much, you know, beyond that. When you think about, you know, what, what kind of a company are you really, you know, what are your people like, how are you thinking about the problems that impact me as a customer? Are you looking around the corner for me? Can I trust you to be a long-term partner if we're thinking about investing, um, you know, a significant amount in um, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of a relationship? I mean, I think really that's where a lot of this emotion, um, you know, comes into play. And I would say in terms of um, trust, obviously, you know, we look okay. at that issue. Um you froze.
Hi, can you hear me? I can, Joe. I think Paul froze. Oh, Paul, are you there? There you are. Yeah, I'm back. I'm sorry. Everything no froze for me for no a moment. Worries. <laughs> These things um, happen. But I think I think you I think everything was good and you'd reached the end of your thought. Um, Kim can chime in if that's not the case, and we'll obviously edit this little sure. discussion. Well, the, just the one the one data point that I was going to add on to that is in our research, the most recent study, we found that um, 50, uh, nearly sixty percent of B two B buyers told us that. Um, Actually, you know, uh, consuming a company's thought leadership is a more trustworthy basis for understanding a company's capabilities and credibility than marketing materials. Um, and, and so um, I think that just kind of reinforces the point that it is, you know, much more than speeds and feeds. Right. Um, Victoria, yeah, that, that's an interesting point for, uh, for you, I'm, I'm guessing, because you are a marketing person. Um, and so I'm assuming that you look at thought leadership and try to figure out all the ways that you can use that across the marketing mix. Um, is this an area where you very much see PR and comms taking a lead or do you see it um, really crossing all of the sort of paid and earned channels that you have, um, owned media, the, the full, full panoply of what you supervise as a CMO? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a little bit of danger, Paul, and we all do it to start with who owns which channel, who owns which piece of content, who owns whatever. I, I've never been able to be successful in any way without starting a conversation across the table with my partners to say, hey, what are your goals? Here are my goals. How do we do them together? Um, you build, again, you got to build the trust with your own people. And, and with our comms team, we just sat down as we worked on the brand work. And now we have an investor rollout because we just had an amazing vote uh, last week about shifting our primary listing to the U.S. And we said we can't go in two different directions, right? They're the same people who are going to get the same message. And so we started there, right? We just committed that from scoping, from the start of a project, we were going to have the other team be part of that conversation. And we were going to use each other's material in order to be consistent. Um, paid, earned, owned. I mean, I, you know, we could certainly categorize it that way. The customer doesn't consume it that way, though. And so I think there's just such a danger. There's a, you need to have an appreciation for how to activate it, but I think there's a danger in segmenting the way you go to market with that. Um, what I will tell you is if our company message and our brand message is not exactly the same with the same voice, we have missed and we will confuse our customers. And so the beauty of just building the brand is we get to do it together. Um, the, the last piece I will leave you with, and I, and I appreciate your comment, Joe, about thought leadership is more trustworthy than marketing materials. Agreed. Uh, the job for marketing at Ferguson isn't about product. It is, and, and the field will do that, and the field will say, here's a promotion, or right, here's what we have going today. The role of mar enterprise level marketing is all about storytelling and thought leadership, all of it, right? It becomes what's the brand, what's our promise, our value proposition, and then bringing that to life with stories and with thought leadership, with insights that left the customer better than when we got them. That's not my business to sell one product over another. That's another group kind of doing that. So, you just talk to people, communication, talk to people and, and plan it together. It's amazing what you can do <laughs> when you when you when you start there. So something else that you said early on that struck me as um, an undervalued topic in the B2B community compared to the consumer space <laughs> is purpose. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, pur purpose has become one of the the predominant buzzwords in consumer marketing over the last couple of years. But, but tell me a little bit about how that pertains to the B2B arena and how a company like Ferguson approaches the idea of purpose. That's a great question. Um, again, I go back to because emotion is much more, um, it's much more important and relevant in B2B decision-making. Um, and the complexity around that, I would say purpose is more important than ever. So why, and, and, and the way we couched it is 
why the heck do we get up every day? What is the single driving force? If you think about what our customers are doing, why does any associate in this company get up? Because if we're a distributor, if we just look at it as a distributor, that's easy to replicate, right? I mean, we're just moving boxes, but we're not. We're that much more. And so it was the work to get to what that purpose is. And I'll, and I'll share it with you in a minute. But your other question was, how did we get there? Well, we started methodically. We said, who's the community we serve? So we got alignment there. And then, and then the three elements of purpose are really three questions. What are you? We're not a distributor. We're not a supply house. How are you better? And why do you exist? And the why you exist from an investment standpoint also says, um, we've got a great business model, right? This is, this is what drives us every single day to get up. And as I mentioned to you for Ferguson, we're a project success company is the what. We serve this community of proud builders. So you can see how people associate themselves with that. Um, and the purpose of we exist to simplify, comp to make complex projects simple, successful, and sustainable. None of our competition can say that. Right? They just can't. We, there's a lot of project companies. There's not a lot that can simplify the complex. And so there is great pride in that expertise and that complexity. Um, and, and our CEO has used it through all the investor days, through our analyst calls. And the response we've received from the investment community as we shift our listing has been, now I get what you do, right? And that's a sustainable business model. Sure, you have to have the financials and the inventory supply chain, as you can imagine, is huge for us. But if that's the driving force, that's um, inspiring and it's not easy to duplicate. And so for us, that's where purpose is really critical um, from, a, from a motivation as well as a business growth standpoint. Great. Um, well, I, apart from anything else, I have to say that I'm looking forward to the end product <laughs> yes, uh, <you> do. <laughs> uh, of, of this process mm -hmm. um, at Ferguson. It sounds like you've really gone through it, you know, step by step, building it rather than, you know, I, I think there's a lot of um, shoot ready aim still in the marketing game and uh, it's, it's nice to see somebody approaching it in in a different way um joe anything you want to add about the research or um you know your your findings on b2b um thought leadership that we haven't touched on in this discussion because you're the expert well sure and, and and if it's okay i was actually just going to add a quick build on um with what victoria was saying around purpose i mean a, another aspect of this is and there's a lot of diversity within b2b obviously in terms of industries but um you know her comment about supply chain um and just also you know what kind of company are you in terms of diversity uh, like, you know, not just talking about it, but what are you actually doing? Um, sustainability. I mean, these are driving forces where in order to actually be uh, sort of qualified to work with certain companies, you need to be able to not just communicate around that, but show that you're, um, you know, living those values in, in tangible ways. And then the other, um, the other one, uh, you know, just kind of given the environment that we're in is talent. Um, and so it's not just consumer facing companies, but um, talent of all kinds want, you know, they want to work for companies that, um, you know, that have purpose and are making meaningful uh, strides uh, around those other topics. The only other thing um, going back to the, to the research that I would call out that was interesting is that um, an overwhelming amount of buyers told us this year that they want thought leadership content that is both intellectually rigorous and fun. Oh, yeah. And that, was, and that was something that we hadn't seen. And it goes back to some of the what we've talked about in terms of emotion, but it was something that we hadn't seen in previous years research. And um, in a way, and look, I don't think any of us has a, the perfect answer off the top of our head uh, on how to do that all the time. But it, it just kind of illustrates the challenge and the complexity of being effective with B2B marketing and thought leadership, where sometimes you have to talk about really sort of nitty gritty, thorny issues. And then at the same time, how do you actually make that enjoyable to consume when you're competing with so many other things for, uh, for somebody's attention? So that was just one other um, observation I would share. Yeah. Hey, Joe, if I can just add one thing to that, Paul, I think what's really important is that balance always has to be there. Are you giving them something that they need to know whether they want to know it or not? And are you making it easy to hear it? 
right? And so sometimes that's about taking the bite out of something. Sometimes that's about um, making something dry, silly in some ways, right? It's it's taking your medicine in some ways, right? Are you giving people what they need and are you providing it in a way that's enjoyable to consume? Sometimes we call it hiding the vegetables. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. I might use that. That's terrific. I, 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 think, I think actually there's probably no better way to... to bring this to a close than then to to throw out yet another um counterintuitive idea which is that business to business marketing is fun um i i, I i'm sure that's been your experience victoria and and, and joe um mm-hmm. it hasn't always been mine but i um probably haven't immersed myself in the field to anything like the extent you have so it's storytelling it's purpose driven it's emotional it's fun it's business to business marketing for the 2020s great thank you so much everybody thank you thank you you've been listening to the provoke podcast brought to you by provoke media and produced by the international broadcast specialist marketers